Hi everyone, my name is Xin Zhe Fu. I'm a third year PhD student at MIT Lab for Information and Decision Systems. In this video, I present our paper, Fundamental Limits of Volume-Based Network DOS Attacks. It's a joint work with my advisor, Professor Itan Modiano. I'll first briefly introduce the motivation behind this work, and I'll focus more on modern problem formulation and explaining the intuition of the main results. So the DOS attack is one of the main security threats in the internet. Its end goal is typically to make some network resources unavailable to their intended users. One type of network DOS attack works by trying to exploit the vulnerability in the protocols, but a more significant and predominant kind works by just flooding the victim by sheer volume of traffic. In this work, we focus on building a queuing theoretic framework for the second kind, volume-based attacks. So let's get started with the net modern problem formulation. In this video, I'll focus on single hop networks. And in our paper, we have multi-hop networks and SN extension. So the single hop network model mainly mirrors server farms. In the network, there's a set of servers, we use S to think of a set of servers. And there's a set of user, user traffic dispatchers U and a set of adversarial traffic dispatchers V. The main theme of this work is to study how should the adversarial traffic dispatchers send traffic to the servers so that it can make the service unavailable to user traffic dispatchers. So also for a generic user traffic dispatcher UL, we use SUL to denote the set of servers that UL is connected to. Same for a generic adversarial traffic dispatcher VM. So let's look at together look at this example, which will be the running example of this talk. So for user traffic dispatcher U1, SU1 is just S1. And for U2, SU2 is S1, S2 and S3. And for U3, SU3 is the set S2, S3 and S4. And for each server, there's a queue at the server and uh, the survey rules of the servers, the traffic rate rates at uh, user traffic dispatcher and universal traffic dispatcher are all IID stochastic processes this uh, the mean race denoted in this. We also call these race network statistics. And we assume the user traffic dispatchers to use join the shortest queue routing, which is the uh, common load balancing policy. That is at each time slot, the user traffic dispatchers send the traffic to the server with the shortest queue among the ones that it has connection to. And the service discipline is assumed to be first come first serve. And we will use A, and B to denote the quantity related to arrival to the servers and the service offered by the server. Based on the above notations, we can write the Q evolution as this. We can also decompose the Q at each server as user traffic and adversarial traffic. Note that this decomposition is just for the sake of exposition. So in our model, the user traffic and adversarial traffic are queued together. So there's only one queue at each server. So based on the above setup, we're ready to formally define our problem, the network DOS attack problem. The goal of this problem is to find an adversarial injection policy under which there exists a server such that the user traffic in the server grows linearly with time. The problem is feasible if there exists such an injection policy. Note that here we, we ask the user traffic to grow with time instead of the whole queue. So it's worth, a while, it's worth pausing a while to just reflect on these two different objectives, where the first one is that we take that is the user traffic, and the second one, an alternative, is just let the queue grow with time. So we think our objective here is more meaningful in terms of modeling perspective, and also is more challenging from a theoretical point of view. Because first, the net end goal of a network DOS attack is to make some resource unavailable to its intended user. So it's not just to compromise some server, but rather to prevent the user from getting a service. And also, you can take a look at this example. Let's focus on the server S2. So um, if V1 and V2 put all their resources to S2, then of course the server S2 will be overloaded. And if we just use Q instead of QU here, then it will satisfy the objective. 
But in this case, as the user traffic inspection U1, U2, and U3, they are doing join the shortest queue. Actually, they can still receive normal service because uh, U1 can send its traffic to S1 and U2, U3, they can send traffic to S3 and S4. So if the adversary really wants to uh, block the user traffic from getting service, it needs to do something smarter. For example, it can choose to uh, let U1 send a traffic of three to uh, S2. Uh, for V2, it split half and half, so four to S2 and four to S3. And for V3, it uh, puts its traffic to S3. And uh, we can verify that under this smarter allocation, the adversary actually achieves this goal. So this goal, we feel, is more uh, interesting and more meaningful than just letting the queue blow up. And now let's continue to uh, get through our main results. So first, let's just recall our definition. So our goal is to study the fundamental limits of this problem. And the fundamental limits, there are two aspects. The first is to characterize when the problem is feasible, that is to characterize the feasibility region of this problem. And it turns out that we will show this feasibility region is fully determined by the network statistics. The second aspect is to come up with an optimal policy. Policy is optimal if it achieves this feasibility region. That is, it achieves this goal uh, whenever the problem is feasible. So we will propose such an optimal policy. And a remarkable property is that our policy does not rely on the knowledge of network statistics. So let's start from this with the feasibility region. To do this, we need some uh, further definitions. So for each subset of the service S prime, that is in S, we use U S prime to denote the set of user dispatchers that only have connections in S prime. So basically the traffic, user traffic from U S prime can only go to S prime. S prime sort of traps this U S prime. So if you look again at this example and we focus on this S2 and S3 as S prime, then U.S. prime is this singleton set U2. The traffic from user traffic from U2 can only go to S2 and S3. And also we define delta S prime as the capacity margin of the subset of the server. So it's defined by the sum of the server's service capacity minus in S prime minus the sum of user traffic error rates in U.S. prime. So again, in this example, this is S prime, then delta S prime will be six plus six minus three, that is nine. And third, we use value as prime to denote the maximum capacity reduction that the adversary can inflict as prime. In this case, as you mentioned, by uh, adversary special V1 injecting three to S2, uh, V2 have four here, four, th four here, and V3 injects three here, value as prime is actually 12 because the adversary can completely reduce the capacity of this subset to zero. And uh, to generally to calculate a uh, value as prime, we can use this linear program. So uh, the optimal value of this linear program is equal to value as prime. And the optimal solution actually gives us a way uh, to say how the adversary should uh, allocate its resources to achieve this value as prime. So the, the objective of this linear program is to maximize capacity reduction and the constraints are as follows. The first one says that it's basically a constraint on the adversary's resource because it's, the inject traffic cannot uh, be greater than the arrived traffic adversary dispatchers. And the second constraint says that the capacity reduction on each individual server in the set cannot be greater than the service uh, capacity. And the third is basically a topology constraints and the fourth is an activity constraint. So based on this definition, I think intuitively it should be clear that we can sort of characterize the feasibility region in the following way. So if there is, is a subset of server S prime such that some user dispatcher will, or the user traffic is trapped in it and the maximum damage that the adversary can do to this subset is greater than the capacity margin, then by injecting according to this solution to the, to the linear program, 
the adversary can sort of successfully trap the user traffic. And this is indeed correct. You can formalize, you can formalize this intuition by first defining this value condition. So a subset of servers satisfy this value condition if US prime is then empty and the uh, value S prime, which is the damage that the adversary can do is greater than delta S prime, that is the margin. And uh, this theory, in this theorem, will formally show that the network US pro attack problem is feasible if and only if there exists a subset of server that satisfies this value condition. And uh, basically the proof of the uh, theorem is just to formally uh, formalize the intuition I just described. And also from the proof, we can have this uh, natural corollary that uh, to check the feasibility of the problem, instead of going over all the subsets of the servers, we can only check uh, the subset of servers that is induced by subset of user dispatchers. So based on the feasibility region, we continue to proceed to talk about this optimal policy. So the reasoning about the feasibility region actually gave us a recipe for finding an optimal policy. The optimal policy needs to first find a subset of servers that satisfy the value condition. We we'll call this a vulnerable set. And second, it needs to find a way to allocate the, to inject the adversarial traffic to inflict the damage that is equal to this value as prime. If we know all the network statistics, this is easy to do. We can just go enumerate over all the subsets and then for each subset, we solve the corresponding LP and inject according to the LP solution. But how to do so without the knowledge of network statistics? The answer we give is to use the QLAN information and take advantage of the properties of joint service Q. So here, we will show that if the adversary dispatchers also do join the service Q, the same as the users, then it can join this join the service Q will prevent wasting resources, which corresponds to the second goal, and also facilitates the identification of the vulnerable set, vulnerable set which corresponds to the first goal. So first, about how J JSQ prevents wasting resources. Let's take a look at this simple example, which is the subgraph of the previous example. If this adversary dispatcher has a, has a traffic rate of eight, and uh, this is uh, his target set, Obviously, the value of the set is eight. But if the adversary dispatcher is not careful, for example, it put too much resource to one server, if it put all the resource to one server that on the top, then it can only inflict damage of six, which is smaller than eight, because it wastes a resource of two over the top server. If the adversary of is doing join the source queue, then this GSQ can you can actually intuitively you can show that this GSQ exactly prevents this kind of case of wasting resources from happening. So we can formally show that the adversary dispatchers inject following the GSQ will be as effective as they were following the solution to the linear program. And second is that joint shortest queue facilitates the identification of the vulnerable sets. So again, we take this example. If this adversary dispatcher uses join the shortest queue and these two user dispatchers also are using join the shortest queue, then the total arrival rate to these two servers is 13 and the total server rate is 12. Because they're all doing join the shortest queue, so some kind of load balancing is happening, the queue growth rate on both two servers will be 0.5. So in this set, in a vulnerable set, um, the queues in the set, actually they all grow, they grow together. This notion can be formalized, it can be formally proved by combining the results from these two papers. So with two, these two sort of nice properties, nice to the adversary, uh, nice properties of drawing the shorter two at hand, we, you introduce the optimum policy we come up with, that is a mean zero policy. It's, it's a very simple idea. So at every time slot, the adversary maintains a target subset as a potential vulnerable set. And all the adversary dispatchers that has connection to the subset will inject to the subset for in the joint shortest queue. If at the end of the time stop, the minimum queue length in the subset is zero, 
then at the next time slot, the adversary will switch randomly switch to another target subset. Otherwise, it will keep injecting to the same subset at uh, the next time slot. So the intuition is that the, basically the mean zero works by identifying vulnerable subsets through trial and error. The trial here means that it just injects according to join the shortest queue. As we have mentioned, under the join the shortest queue, if the adversary is targeting a vulnerable set, that is a correct target subset, then you will always inflict the damage of value as prime. So this trial phase utilizes this that property of join the shortest queue. And the error phase basically means that how can the adversary realize from just QLens information that it is targeting a truly vulnerable subset or a, or a wrong sub target subset. So as we, have, uh, as we have shown that if it's targeting a vulnerable subset, then all the queues in the subset, in the subset grow with time. So this sort of implies that the minimum queue life in the subset will not reach zero very often. So if the queue less does, if the minimum queue less does reach zero, then it can be treated as a signal that the adversary may be targeting a wrong subset. So uh, this is the intuition behind the main zero, and uh, we can prove that formally prove that the mean zero works by constructing a Lyapunov function that is the pert perturbed version of the mean theorem, and we can show that the Lyapunov function has positive truth. So this is the contrary. We are, because we are trying to prove that it destabilizing the network, so the Lyapunov function has positive truth. And uh, using the result from this paper, we can show that the Q length and target set Markov chain is transient. And based on this and other uh, uh, more reasoning, we can show that the mean zero policy is optimal. Right, so this has been an overview of the main results of our paper. If you're interested or can want to see the extension uh, to the multi-hop networks, please refer to our paper. Thank you.